Did you know there are 12 pieces of punctuation that you learn all the way through primary school that you actually need to know in order to answer every single punctuation question that comes up in the Key Stage 2 GPS paper? And they are capital letters, full stops, question marks, exclamation marks, commas, apostrophes, inverted commas, as in speech, brackets, dashes, colons, semicolons, and finally, the good old hyphen. Just 12 pieces of punctuation. And in this video, we are going to explore some old SATS questions, going all the way back to 2017 in some cases, to uh, learn how to solve these sorts of questions and, and master all of that punctuation ready for your upcoming SATS. So stick around until the end. I'll be using chapters down below. So guys, if you wanna skip to certain pieces of punctuation that you wanna to touch up on, then please feel free to do that. And make sure you leave a comment before you go today with what you liked about the video. So let's dive straight in then. Now I'm not gonna do all of the basics guys. I, you know, I've, I've only picked questions from previous years that I remember children you getting wrong all the time. And I thought, right, I know these questions are tricky, so let's explore why. I'm not gonna do all the basics. So I'm gonna do a couple of things on capitals and full stops first, just questions that I think are still quite tricky, even though this is probably some of the most basic punctuation to learn. So here's my first question, it's from the 2019 paper. And it's as simple as this. Now, as we go through, guys, I'll give you lots of opportunities to pause the video and, uh, and have a go at each question. So let's read this one together. It says, circle each word that should begin with a capital letter in the sentence below. I want you to have a go at this question first in your head and come back to see if you got all of them. Okay, so the reason this question is great is because it tests you on lots of different types of capital letters, not just the classic starting a sentence. Okay, so there's your first one. So we'd be circling this one here to start a sentence. Now, here's a trick, okay? Sometimes children will think, oh, museum, that's quite, that's, that, maybe, that's, maybe that's a proper noun. It's not a proper noun unless it's named. Museum is a common noun, whereas um, if I said the Natural History Museum, you can see right here, because it's now the name of the museum, the proper name, the proper noun, all three letters in Natural History, History Museum would need capitals. So this does not need a capital. I see that get circled all the time. Birmingham, however, is the name of a place. So that needs it. Moving on. So we always check as we read along. When we visited the museum in Birmingham, we're happy so far. New main clause here. Gareth is the name of someone arranged to travel by train. Again, it's not the name of a train. It's just a common noun with Aunt Laura. So in this case, we need a capital A and a capital L because the name of this person is Aunt Laura. That includes their title, kind of like you would do for your teacher like me, Mr. Stevens. You don't only capitalize the S, you capitalize the M as well because it's becoming part of my name. So did you get all five? If you did, you're off to a good start. If you didn't, then this is the video for you. Um, I've got two more questions on this. I, I just thought it was interesting. This came up in the 2023 paper. And then on my next slide, I've got an extremely similar question that came up the year before, just to show you how often they repeat the same sort of content in these papers. So in this one, you've got to do full stops as well. Insert full stops and capital letters in the passage below so that it's punctuated correctly. Please double check your answer before you press play again. Okay, so let's whiz through again. Obviously, we're gonna start our sentence with a capital. We hope that you enjoy the new school meals. The menu will be put on the school website. If you have any comments, please send us an email. Okay, I'm gonna put a full stop at the end, and often I see children here go, ah, that sounds all right. What they're doing is using run-on sentences. Run-on sentences is when one sentence is complete. It's a complete idea. It should have a piece of punctuation. A new sentence begins, but children often just allow them to run on with no punctuation. So let's think about this in complete ideas. We hope that you enjoy the new school. Well, I can see from the next bit that it's definitely part of the sentence. We hope that you enjoy the new school meals. Now, because I've got the word the here, it does not flow if I carry on saying that. The new school meals, the menu. Doesn't make sense. This is the start of my next sentence. The menu will be put on the school website if you have any comments. But then the problem with that is, it sounds like it should flow, but then we have a comma here. The, the menu will be put on the school website if you have any comments, comma, please send us an email. There's clearly two ideas here and we've missed it. We've got to go back a step. The menu will be put on the school website is a complete idea. The next sentence just happens to start with a subordinate clause. So that subordinate conjunction being at the start of the sentence made it really feel like it was going to be part of the previous sentence. If you have any comments, comma, main clause starts here, please send us an email. Does that make sense, guys? So we've got them all. Capital letter here, full stop capital, full stop capital, and a full stop at the end. You'd need all of that just to get the one mark. And I've seen all of this before, guys, and I've seen children do this. 
they've checked all of the, all of the hard stuff and then they just forgot there was a full stop at the end and they don't get the mark. So you've got to try to avoid those donut errors. And look, 2022 paper, extremely similar question, exactly the same thing. It's just a different passage of writing. So have a go at that one. This is where we get to really expose how these papers are written, guys, because look how similar it is in structure. We've got frogs are amphibians. Give us a capital letter this time. Frogs are amphibians. They live on land. So we've got a run on sentence straight away right here. That's clearly just the end of that sentence. We've got a new idea starting here. They live on land, but they lay their eggs in water. That feels like a complete idea. Just always check the next bit. Their eggs are called frog spawn. Okay, that's clearly a new idea. So we're going to put a, a capital, a full stop and a capital here. Now look what happens. Just like before, um, we've got the same sort of thing happening with the, um, the subordinate clause and things. Ready? Watch this. Their eggs are called frog spawn during the winter. Then it says, but then it's a comma and a whole new sentence. Frogs hibernate at the bottom of ponds. This comma wouldn't make sense. It would be called a comma splice if we allowed it to just run on like this. This is not right. What's actually happening here is we've got another one of those sentence openers that feels like it joins to the sentence before. Their eggs are called frog spawn. End of sentence. During the winter, comma, it's a, it's a fronted adverbial, it's the start of a sentence. Frogs hibernate at the bottom of ponds or in compost heaps. Full stop. So once again, right here, just like on the question before, right here, it was really trying to trick children, catch them out um, for not properly reading these sentences in their head and finding the expression almost um, as to where an idea stops and perhaps where the fronted adverbial of the next sentence begins. So there, there you go. Even full stops and capital letters can be really tricky and a lot of children get that wrong. Let's move on to one of my favorite bits of punctuation to teach, which is commas. And commas are great because there's just so many uses for them. But in the SATs, they're kind of broken down into just three uses, all right? We've got commas for lists, which you'll be learning when you're much younger. That's probably probably the first use of commas that you actually picked up. Then you've got fronted adverbials. In other words, sentence openers, okay? Like we just saw in those last two questions, those commas being used. And then the last one is to clarify meaning. There's quite a wide um, breadth of, of coverage there because that can be anything from just avoiding a bit of confusion, like the classic sentence that we've all seen that says, let's eat grandma, okay? And how that, that's very confusing unless we put the comma in, then it changes the meaning completely to saying to grandma, let's eat. So that's, that's a classic example of avoiding confusion, but it also means even things like relative clauses. So when you have two, a pair of commas with some extra information in the, in the middle, you need those commas so that the sentence makes sense. But we'll get onto that in a second. Let's have a look at some question examples. We're going back to the 2019 paper right now. And uh, I picked this question because I really like these ones where it asks you to write something. Because a lot of children know the answer, but they just don't, they don't clarify it in the way they write the answer. So I want you to have a little go at this one, which is explain how the comma changes the meaning in the second sentence. And come back to see if your answer would get a mark. So quite clearly in the first one, Jake Thomas is a person. That's a first name and last name. And Lily is a person, so there's two people. And in the second one, we've got Jake, comma, Thomas, and Lily, we've got three people. So we know what's happening here. The comma is changing it from two people to three people. But if you were just to write, uh, there's more people in the second one, you don't get the mark because you're not actually being clear enough. It said explain how the comma changes the meaning. You're not really explaining if you're just saying that oh, there's more people in the second one, you have to be specific. A good answer might be in the first sentence, there are two people, Jake Thomas and Lily. In the second sentence, the comma makes it so there are three people, Jake, Thomas and Lily. Being specific with the number of people that it's changed from and to makes it more likely that you'll get the mark. All right, good question. Um, Let's have a look at this one. So this is an insert one. So there's two sentences. You've got to put the comma into both ones. Have a go and come back for my really easy explanation to make sure you get these right every time. So nice and easy. Look, if we've got a fronted adverbial, then that means by definition, we have a main clause somewhere as well. The main clause is the bit of the sentence, the sentence that makes sense by itself, okay? You could just have it without the fronted adverbial and it would still make sense. And you can find them really easily by just reading it with some expression in your head. So luckily for us, the ball rolled slowly past the goal. Quite clearly, the main clause is here. The ball rolled slowly past the goal. That's the main clause. So if that's my main clause, then that makes this my fronted adverbial. And quite simply, we need to use a comma between a fronted adverbial and a main clause to show the reader when we've moved on from the fronted adverbial 
and our starting the main clause. So a comma, quite simply, would go right here after us. Quick note, if you don't actually draw your commas properly, for example, I've seen someone before just kind of do this, they didn't get the mark because if you don't know what the punctuation looks like, then how could you get a mark? Do you know what I mean? You might know where it goes, but if your comma doesn't look like a comma, you're gonna lose marks. It happens a lot, believe it or not. So make it really clear where your comma is and what it looks like and where it goes. Next one, same logic. After three hours of hard work, the builders manage to dig out the tree. A lot of children do this. They go, after three hours, yep, that sounds like a fronted adverbial, because it could be, couldn't it? After three hours, I ran outside. It is in that sentence, but please just read the whole thing. It clearly doesn't end there. It says, after three hours of hard work, then the main clause starts here, because that bit makes sense by itself. The builders managed to dig out the tree. If I said, of hard work, the builders managed to dig out, dig out the tree, that wouldn't make sense as a main clause. So very easy test there. But if you're being a bit lazy or a bit quick, you, you can easily lose marks here, guys. Be careful. So here's what I was talking about, avoiding confusion. We've got a pair of commas. Where would the pair of commas go in this sentence? And by that, I just simply mean there are two commas to put into this sentence to make it make sense. Have a go. So let's read it. The African elephant, the African elephant, the largest land mammal in the world, can weigh up to 6.6 .6 tons. Just like before, there's still a main clause here. It's just that the extra information isn't at the start or at the end, it's in the middle of the sentence. So the main clause here is the African elephant can weigh up to 6.6 .6 tons. That makes this chunk here our parenthesis, our extra information. So we need to put a comma before it and a comma after it to show that it's extra information. Simple as that. It happened, um, it happened in, the, in a different paper as well. Here's the 2018 paper. So have a go at this one, exactly the same type of question, hopefully nice and easy now, using that strategy of looking for um, the main clause. No, not a main clause, ignore me guys. This, one's, this one is for a list. So insert, add the two commas to the sentence below to make it clear that Anna has four favorite things. This is a really, really important um, piece of information for this question. I love this question purely because, again, children are confident with commas but not reading the question properly would do this. Anna's favourite things are camping holidays, cycling and swimming. So two mistakes here. Number one, we, do we need a comma here? I don't think so. But they saw that it said add two, so they thought, okay, well, there's the things. Camping holidays, cycling and swimming. And the second thing is not realising that if that was wrong, then where would the other comma go? Clearly one goes here. Well, camping can be separate. So again, look how much that's avoiding confusion there, that comma. Is it camping holidays or is it camping and holidays as two separate things? Well, this is the only way we can add two commas here to show that there are one, two, three, four things that Anna likes to do. A really lovely question, well designed um, to, to reward children who are just thinking carefully and know how to use commas in lists. So on to some speech. Um, first thing... These little things here, we, most people call them speech marks. The proper name is inverted commas. Just remember that because it does come up in the test as inverted commas. It very rarely says speech marks. In fact, I don't think it's ever said speech marks as that phrase. It uses the word inverted commas. So let's start here. Which sentence is punctuated correctly? We're going to draw out some really interesting learning from this, but I want you to have a go first. So let's just really quickly remind ourselves how to um, how to punctuate speech, all right? So the first thing, there's a few rules, and we won't go over every single rule right now, but there's a few rules that we need to get this question right. So firstly, we're always gonna have two clauses, aren't we? We're gonna have a reporting clause, that's the bit who tells you who said it, and we're always going to have the actual directed speech, the direct speech, the thing that's being said, the bit that's inside the inverted commas. And it doesn't matter how you how, which way you do it around. For example, you could have the reporting clause first. It could be, Mr. Price yelled, and then you could have your speech. I'm the best at maths. Or it could be the other way around, couldn't it? We could punctuate it so that it said, I'm the best at maths, yelled Mr. Price. And I could have my reported clause last. But what you need to know is really important, and kids always fail to understand this, so listen carefully, which is that whatever clause comes first, after the last letter of that clause, you need your piece of punctuation. Now, usually it's a comma, unless it's overridden by something like a question mark or an exclamation mark. So whatever your first clause, uh, however your first clause ends, whether it's reported or the direct speech, it needs a comma directly after the last letter. If you were typing, well, the second you type that last letter in your sentence, the next thing is a piece of punctuation, uh, either a comma or an exclamation mark or a question mark. That's so important to understand. 
okay? And the reason I say it like that is because if the direct speech comes first, then that piece of punctuation goes inside of the speech marks. And then you get your reported clause, whoever, whoever said it, okay? If it's the other way around and you've got your reported clause first, you still have a comma first, and then you start your speech marks for the direct speech that goes here. Does that make sense, guys? So basically, sometimes teachers say, oh, all your punctuation always goes inside the speech marks. And I know what they mean, but the problem is sometimes children get to writing their speech this way around with a reported clause first, and what do they end up doing? They end up doing their reported clause, starting the speech, then putting the comma, and then starting their speech here because they've been told that, the, that all the punctuation goes inside. So just be cautious. The comma always just goes right at the end of whatever the first clause is, and then you can think about using other punctuation. So why is that helpful? Well, it happens in this one for a start. So I'm gonna get rid of the first one straight away because it doesn't actually have any punctuation here. Can you see that? Following my rule, there should be a comma after the word say. You can never have no punctuation there. It's impossible. It will always be punctuated wrong if that was the case. Okay, then we've got these other ones. Now, we can get rid of this one for the same reason. There's nothing here. And we're down to two answers that both have the comma. So there's one other rule that hopefully you can see is really obvious now. Speech must start, when it's a new piece of speech, it must start with a capital letter. So wherever it is, it needs to start with a capital letter. There is a rule for split speech, but we don't need to go into that because it never comes up in this paper. Um, you just need to know that new speech, a new sentence with speech in it, needs to start with a capital letter. So this is correct, and this one is incorrect. And there's our answer. So I know it's a bit of a, a, a whistle stop tour there of speech because there's a lot of you know a lot of things to think about with it. But they're the main things that come up in the GPS paper every year, guys. It's just knowing how the punctuation goes in between the clauses and the capital letters, and quite often the question mark as well, which is going to come up in this one right here. So this one says insert the correct punctuation into the sentence below, and it says, "What time does the concert start?" Whispered Dad as we took our seats really hard question there's a lot of punctuation to add including all of the speech punctuation why don't you have a go see if you can write it down correctly first and then we'll, we'll see if you got it right so using all of our rules firstly let's just identify what the speech clause is and what the uh, reported clause is what time does the concert start that's definitely the speech clause so do you know what first thing i'm going to do is put my inverted commas around it the rest of it says, whispered dad as we took our seats. Now, the next thing I need to do is recognize that this already starts with a capital letter. So that's done for me, but it doesn't end with anything. We've got nothing here. Now, a lot of children would, be, would do what's almost right and just put their comma there because they know it goes right at the end of the clause inside of the inverted commas. But there's a problem there, isn't there? This is clearly a question. What time does the concert start? Question mark, then the speech. Okay, really important important part. Whispered dad as we took our seats. Now, some people would argue about the comma being here. I'll let you have a think about that one, whether you need it or not. Whispered dad, comma, as we took our seats. Do we need that comma or can we get away with not doing it? The main part I want to focus on here is, of course, the speech. Did you get the speech part right? Let's have a look at one more speech question. This is one where you have to do some writing. It says, rewrite the sentence below as direct speech. Remember to punctuate your sentence correctly. So the sentence is, I asked her if she needed, needed any help. How would you turn that into direct speech? Have a go. So direct speech, as I said before, means actually in inverted commas like this. Okay, so it needs to start. It's already put the comma in for us. That's really nice of them. I asked. Now, funny answers I've seen in the past are this. I asked her if she needed any help. And they're like, Yep, I've got it right because I've punctuated it properly. Full stop at the end. Speech marks done. And all they've done is take the exact words of that one, put it into here. They don't get the mark because it doesn't make any sense. That's not actually a question you would ask someone. You wouldn't say, um, her, if she needed any help, if you're trying to ask someone if they need help, you'd ask something a bit more logical, right? A bit more sensible. You'd probably say, I asked, do you need any help? So one mark, one little tick for capital letter. Do you need any help? help question mark is my second mark i'm going to bring my inverted commas over here to make it really clear and third little tick here would be for your inverted commas you have to get all of that right to get the mark because it's a punctuation test it's a grammar spelling and punctuation test you've got to get it all right and if you spelt something wrong in here let's say you spelt help like with a with a i don't know with an a help 
then you'd also lose the mark because it's a grammar, spelling and punctuation test. So you've got to be really cautious of those things all the time. All right, moving on to apostrophes. Now, apostrophes can be really complex, but you know what? I reckon I can explain it to you fairly, fairly simply in this video, this, this short-ish video. For, considering we're doing a whole key stage two curriculum here of punctuation, I think I've summarized it quite well into a, a short video. So po apostrophes, You've got two types, haven't we? We've got a tr contraction, which you learn first. Things like don't, that apostrophe there is just showing us that we've contracted two words into one, sometimes called omission as well, because we're the, the, the root word there being miss. We're missing out letters, replacing them with the, the apostrophe. Then you've got for possession. If we want to show that something belongs to someone else, uh, but belongs to someone, then we use an apostrophe with an S often on the end, sometimes not, we'll think about why, to show that something belongs to someone. So let's take a look at how this actually comes up in the GPS paper. It's not as hard as you'd think. So I wanted to start with this one. I'm not really going to talk about contractions much because they're just too easy. I'm not going to waste your time doing that. But this one came up in 2019 and I was a year six teacher in 2019. And I remember being, remember being so annoyed with myself because I taught my class how to use contractions, obviously, you know, and we'd done lots of practice and they were very good at them. But I tell you what, I'd never shown them. I'd never shown them specifically this one because I thought, who says shall not in real life? Who who uses the contracted form of this? Which I'm just going to tell you right now, by the way, which is shan't. Who says shan't in real life? No one says that. Certainly not around here anyway. But there we go. Maybe people say it in other places in the country. Do you say shan't? Let me know in the comments if you say shan't in your general vocabulary. So all my kids sat there going, oh, I don't know. They were making them up. They were doing a really good job at guessing. They were going... Shallant, shallant, I don't know, shallant, that looks about right, you know, that's often what happens. Bless them. So there we are, you can always be tricked by something. The tester, her writers obviously thought, let's not test them if they can do contractions that year, let's just give them the most obscure one we can think of and see if they've heard of the word. Silly. Anyway, so this is a classic question, it comes up every year, something like this. This was this was years ago, this was from the 2017 paper, but I think it's a good example of, of um, this kind of question, where you simply get, are given a sentence and you just have to tick, is the apostrophe in that sentence being used for contraction or is it being used for possession? Why don't you, why don't you have a go? See if you can get all four. There's a simple test really, isn't there, guys? Um, you can either replace it, try to pretend it's contraction, replace this with like is or has or was. Where is Karen is pen? Karen has pen. Doesn't make sense. Quite clearly the pen just belongs to Karen. This is obviously for possession. Let's try the same thing for all four. Joshua's hungry. Joshua's hungry. Does hungry belong to Joshua? Doesn't even make sense. Joshua is hungry. That makes complete sense. It's contraction. This standard for is. Please get the dog is dinner. Please get the dog has dinner. Please get the dog was dinner. None of those make sense. This is not contracted. Dinner belongs to the dog. It's possession. And last one. The cat's outside. Does the outside belong to the cat? Are we saying, hey, that's the cat's outside? No, the cat doesn't belong to the out. The outside doesn't belong to the cat. We're just trying to say the cat is outside. The cat is outside. So again, it's contracted. The cat is outside. So just use the is was test and see if you can replace that apostrophe s with is. And if it makes sense, then it's contraction. If not, it's not. It's a really simple test. This is another good one. Another righty one I've picked because it's a bit trickier. Explain. So think about how we explained in the comma section if you've watched the whole video with that other question. Explain really carefully that how the position of the apostrophe changes the meaning of the second sentence. Do you know what it means when the apostrophe is put on the end like that? Have a quick go. Okay, so I'll very briefly explain this. It's quite simple. Here's my trick that you should use all the time, by the way, guys. Box up the noun. Whatever that comes before the apostrophe, I don't care if there's an S after it or not, but whatever comes before the apostrophe, that was the original noun. And that original noun tells you whether that original noun is singular, as in there's just one of them, or plural, which means more than one. Now, the word brother is singular. If I say the word brother, I can only be referencing one brother. So in this one, we're talking about one brother, the favorite toys that belong to one. In the second one, let's do it again. Look where the apostrophe is now. Box up the noun before the apostrophe. That's your original noun. So my original noun is brothers. Is the word brothers singular or plural? Well, it's plural. If I have brothers, that's more than one brother, okay? So quite clearly now, the, the favorite toys belong to more than one brother. So to get the mark on this one, you can't just say there's a different amount of brothers. You've got to be really specific. You've got to say in the first sentence, the toys belonged to one brother. 
In the second sentence, the toys belong to more than one brother. You can even get the mark by saying in the first sentence, brother is, is singular. In the second sentence, brothers is plural. Simple as that. So you're just showing that you know how a, a plural apostrophes um, can be used. I've got another uh, plural apostrophe kind of question. So it's a true or false one. It came up last year, or for, at least from when I'm recording this, in the 2022 paper. And it says, tick one box in each row to show if the statement about the apostrophe is true or false. So I'll do the first one for you, then you can do the rest. So it goes like this. The boy's lunch was delicious. I know straight away, by the way, that because the apostrophe is here, I can box up my noun, boys. I know that that's plural, so I know that this means more than one boy. The statement is, the apostrophe shows that there is only one boy. That's false, because I've just said there's more than one boy. That's why the apostrophe was after the S, not before it. Why don't you see if you can get the other three as quick as you can? Okay, let's, let's whiz through it. Gina put out the cat's food. Cats is plural for cat, so there is more than one cat. That's true. <laughs> the difficulty of this question is forgetting that there's a statement each time and you're not just ticking for singular or plural. I think it was a bit unnecessary to add the true or false in there, but there we go. Uh, next one. The girl's party is this afternoon. Let's have a look at this. Box up the noun. Girl. That's singular. There is more than one girl. Nope. There's one girl. It's singular. And the last one. Let's box up the noun before the apostrophe. Trees. I know that that means more than one tree. There is only one tree. Nope. It means there's more than one tree. So that one's false as well. Pretty simple, right? With the boxing up method. Maybe you've never learned that before. If this is your first time, then um, hopefully it's helpful. Just box up the noun before the apostrophe and you know whether it's singular or plural. Very simple. Okay, pairs of punctuation. So we, we call this parenthesis normally. The information inside of the punctuation is called parenthesis. It means extra information. But we use pairs of punctuation like brackets, dashes, and commas to do that. So let's just let's have a look at these. I've got interesting here. There's three questions that are very similar. So in the 2023 paper, we had this one. Insert a pair of dashes in the correct place in the sentence below. And all you have to do is read the sentence with a bit of expression like we do a lot and find out which bit is extra information and which bit's the main clause. And because it's a pair of dashes, you know the extra information will be in the middle of the sentence somewhere because you're going to need one dash either side. So let's have a look at this together. But you can pause if you want, but I'm going to answer this one straight away. I'm excited and I mean really excited to be going on holiday next week. If I read that with a bit of expression, you can hear it. I'm excited and I mean really excited to be going on holiday next week. Quite clearly, this part is extra, isn't it? Because the main clause is just, I am excited to be going on holiday next week. So because of that, I need a dash either side, done. Simple as that. Well, that came up in the 2023 paper. Look at this one. This came up in the 2022 paper. Remarkably similar, right? But with commas. Insert a pair of commas in the correct place in the sentence below. See if you can do it this time. Same logic, just a different bit of punctuation. Okay, pair of commas. Let's do this. The African elephant, the largest land mammal in the world, can weigh up to 6.6 .6 tons. Quite clearly, the main clause is... The African elephant can weigh up to 6.6 .6 tons. That's clearly it, right? So my pair of commas is going to go here and going to go here. All right, we had this question earlier. It's the same thing because we were looking at commas and now we're looking at it in, in the eye, through the lens of parenthesis. So hopefully you got that one right if you've been watching the whole video. And then look, in the 2019 paper, believe it or not, they just rehashed the same question again, but this time did it with brackets. So you can see that the, the writers of these papers, they use a lot of the same questions every year. They just kind of change the wording a bit or change the sentence or the piece of punctuation, even though they all do the same thing. Pairs of brackets, dashes and commas. So go on then, pause the video. Where does this one go? Using public transport such as buses and trains, can reduce pollution. Very simple and straightforward to hear. Check it by making sure there's a main clause around it. Using public transport can reduce pollution. That is fine. I've got my one mark. Woohoo. Okay, moving on. Um, love this one. It's my last one I've got on parenthesis. Really good question. Have a go first and I'll explain why I love this question after. All right, what I want to do is, is answer this like I'm a child who's rushing. You ready for this? This is what they do. Uh, two dashes, yep. Mm, two commas, yep. Two, 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 two commas, yep. Uh, that one's not got two commas. It's just a fronted adverbial. Done. Move on. And they don't get the mark. Can you see what I've done wrong? Can you see why I thought that? And maybe why they designed the question like this? This is the correct answer. Let me show you why. There are some books in the cupboard. There's my main clause. Proving that this is extra information. Our classroom has a red door. There's the main clause, proving that this 
is extra information marked by two commas or marked by two dashes. This one isn't because look, to make space tables and tables and the boxes of games. To make space tables and the boxes of games. That doesn't make any sense by itself because what's actually happening here is we've got two commas but they're not being used as a pair of commas. The first one is just a fronted adverbial. To make space, comma, then my main clause starts here. We move to the chairs, comma, for a list, tables and boxes of games. Isn't that a genius way of designing that question to trick children into thinking that aren't really thinking um, that these two commas are being used just like these dashes and these commas. You always got to think carefully, otherwise you will fall into traps. So yeah, great question. Love that one. Okay, I've got two things left. We're going to do this part here, colons, semicolons, and single dashes, and then we've got a little bit on hyphens um, to finish up this super long um, video. Colons, semicolons, and single dashes. Let me just whiz you through these. Okay, right. This is what a colon does. If you can, you write this down. If, you're, if you don't know what colons do, this is what they do. I'm going to explain it to you in two minutes, and you'll be like, oh, wow, why did I never get explained it like that before? Colons introduce stuff. That's it. A colon is used at the end of a main clause. It has to be a main clause. A colon is used at the end of a main clause to introduce the next clause. Simple. Okay, so let's have a look at this question. Many fossils are not as big as people think. Some are so small that you need a microscope to see them. Well, that's interesting. Let's think about this. Many fossils are not as big as people think. That very much introduces, oh, well, what is it that some people think? Or what is it that they get wrong about what, they, you know, what they're thinking? Well, I'll tell you, some are so small that you need a microscope to see them. Oh, that's why people um, are wrong or, or they think they're bigger uh, than they are, smaller than they are, whatever it is. I can't, I can't think. It's been too long. 31 minutes. My brain is, is melting. But you get the idea. It just, it's just introducing the next clause. Many fossils are not as big as people think. Introduces the next thing, which is that some are so small you need a microscope to see them. Very obvious. Um, here's another one. Look, which one uses colons correctly? Think about my rule which is it has to be a main clause before the colon. It has to actually make sense by itself. You should be able to take out the bit after the colon and just put a full stop there instead, and it does make sense. Use that to answer this question really easily. I bought several beach toys a bucket. That does not make sense by itself. I bought several beach toys a... If you said that to someone, they think you lost your mind. Doesn't make sense. I bought several beach toys. That does make sense. And this colon is introducing what those several beach toys are. Do you understand how colons just introduce the thing? In this case, they're introducing a list, which is a very common use of a colon. So this one is correct. Just for the, for, for the example's sake, I brought several. Okay, you'd be thinking several what? That doesn't make sense by itself. This bit has to make sense by itself. Children often think they can do that. I brought several and then they start their list doesn't make sense. The bit before the main clause, sorry, the bit before the colon has to be a main clause. If you know that, you'll get it right every time. Colons introduce. What do semicolons do? Semicolons are very similar to colons. They don't really introduce us, uh, so much. What they do is they join two main clauses together. So you couldn't use a semicolon to introduce this list like this. That wouldn't make sense. Colons can introduce things that aren't main clauses. Or well, it could even be a single word. Semicolons can't. Semicolons are used between two main clauses that are strongly related. So it has to be a sentence and another sentence that the author has thought, oh, they're really closely related, rather than using a conjunction like but or because or therefore or so. Rather than using a conjunction, I'm going to be interesting and use a semicolon instead. So let's use that to solve this one. If you want to pause it, you can. But once again, I'm just going to whiz through this question. In the bag we found, first of all, that's not a main clause. Okay, so we've already solved it as wrong. Then the next bit says five carrots, two cabbages and, and a large onion. Again, not a main clause. Is this, do we even need a bit of punctuation here? In the bag, we found five carrots, two cabbages and a large onion. No, it doesn't need punctuation there anyway, let alone a semicolon. Look at the next one. The book began with a boy called Tim. Okay, that is a main clause. Let's see if the next sentence is a main clause as well that's related. Climbing a steep hill... That, that's not a main clause, is it? It doesn't make sense. It's just, it starts with a verb. It's not, it's not a main clause. So it doesn't quite work, unfortunately. We're not relating two main clauses together. Again, once again, the, boy, uh, the book began with a boy called Tim climbing a steep hill. It's probably just a sentence by itself. So in the both of these, we just don't need any punctuation there anyway, let alone a semicolon. It's not even like it should be a comma or something. It just doesn't need punctuation there. Let's try the next one. Jessie went to look for her brother. Again, that is a main clause. I like that. Bill. 
that's not a main clause, is it? That's just one word. That's a good example of when you'd use a colon because I'm just going to introduce who the brother is. So you might be able to get away with a colon there, not a semicolon, which means the last one must be the answer. And it's a really good example. Watch this. The wind was howling. Cool. That's a main clause. The rain was drumming on the roof. Lovely. That's a lo another lovely main clause. Are they both related? Well, yeah, they're clearly both talking about some sort of storm that was going on. We've got the wind howling and the rain drumming on the roof. And it makes this lovely sentence. The wind was howling. The rain was dr drumming on the roof. This is kind of replacing a conjunction here, isn't it? Like, and, yeah? Also, that kind of thing. So semicolons replace conjunctions and they join two main clauses together that are strongly related. If you've learned those two things and you've written them down, then you, you know, you'll be ready for this test. You'll smash it. So another semicolon one, this time you have a go. Uh, read the question yourself, see if you get the mark. I really like this question because children often read it like this. They go, Frank would like to go to Cornwall next summer. He might also visit France in the spring. Or they read it, Frank would like to go to Cornwall. Next summer, he might also visit France in the spring. And they're like, they both sound right around here, don't they? But the last bit makes it all sound wrong uh, one way or the other. So you have to read the whole sentence. So if we said Frank would like to go to Cornwall and put our semicolon here, and the next bit is next summer, he might also visit France. We might be all right if it didn't have in the spring at the end. But saying next summer and then ending within the spring doesn't make any sense. So clearly it doesn't go there. It must be that the next summer bit was tagged onto this sentence just like in the spring was tagged onto this one. So this is how it really goes. Frank would like to go to Cornwall next summer. Semicolon. He might also visit France in the spring. So they're both main clauses that make sense by themselves. They're strongly related because they're both about where, he, where he'd like to visit. So therefore I can use a semicolon. This could, what could this mean? What conjunction could it be? Frank would like to go to Cornwall next summer. Um, it could be but, but I don't think that quite makes sense. But he might also visit spring, uh, visit France in the spring. It sort of works. So you can usually think of a conjunction that goes there instead as like an extra check. Okay, one thing on single dashes, because I thought this was really interesting when I was looking through all of the old papers. There's only actually ever been one single question every year. There's only one on single dashes. And here they are. I just thought I'd show you all of them. This was the 2023 paper, the 22 paper, and the, and the 2019 paper. Really interesting. Um, so in the first one, let's just do that one together. Insert a dash. What A single dash is used to add extra information to the end of a sentence. So in everything else, we normally use pairs, don't we? Like we'd have a pair of commas if it's in the middle of the sentence, a pair of dashes if, if the extra information's in the middle of the sentence. But we can use a single dash when the extra information is just tagged onto the end. We don't want another dash at the end because that would look really weird, wouldn't it? Imagine finishing a sentence with a dash and then a full stop. It would look strange. So we just do the one dash. In this case, it, it reads like this. The house was in need of repair, dash. The windows were broken and the roof was leaking. So that's my extra information that's kind of explaining why it was in need of repair. Okay, you try the next two. So the answers are as follows. The story was exciting. Dash. Why was it exciting? Well, it was full of action and adventure. There's my extra information that again answers the kind of why, like it did in this one. It was very it was a very exciting lesson. Dash. Oh, I wonder why. Oh, we learnt how parachutes work and designed one of our own. So all of this extra information, again, attempts to add more reason. They're all like a because, aren't they, to the main clause at the start. Simple as that. That's it, guys. So we've got the last thing, which is hyphens. I'm not going to spend too long on hyphens. If you've made it this far, if you've watched the whole video, by the way, then well done, because this is like 40 minute video. Um, I've designed chapters so that you could skip around. But if you've watched the whole thing, then clearly you just want to smash this paper. Well done. Good for you. Hyphens. So hyphens, all hyphens do is combine... Uh, ideas into one that's it so if you have words that could mean something else by themselves that you actually want to combine you want to compound them into a single meaning then to avoid any confusion of, of your readers thinking that the word means its original meaning or a different meaning then you should just put a hyphen between them to um, combine them so in this example here we've got lots of different versions here of most up-to-date computer with hyphens all over the place now have a look at it what do you think the correct answer is we've got up to we've got most up-to-date We've got up-to-date computer and up-to-date. Well, the correct answer is actually the bottom one because the only three words that we're trying to combine into one meaning now is up-to-date. You think about how people use that phrase as a sing almost like it's a, a single word, up-to-date. And we need hyphen because we don't want people to think we're meaning the word up 
as in like the direction up. We don't want people to think we're meaning date as in like going on a date or even the date, you know, what is the date right now? Up to date simply has one single meaning, which is just means really modern. And that's it. All right. So we don't want to combine computer with it because computer does just mean computer. It's not part of this compounded meaning. Computer just means computer. It doesn't have any different meaning. So there we are. Um, see if you can do it in this one. So this time you've got to insert the hyphen. Which, which two words need to be joined together? Because without it, someone could be confused that they mean two different things. So it's not very busy, because very is just an adverb. It's just, that's just a standard adverb we used before things. There's no confusion there. However, it does go between run up, because there's nothing to do with running and there's nothing to do with the direction up. When we put run up together, it has a new meaning, a new compound meaning, which just means in the time before, the, the immediate time before something. We were very busy in the time before the school play. That's it. Run up is now a new, has a new meaning, so we combine them with a hyphen. And last one, I think, on this, have a go, 2019 paper, which which pair of words needs the hyphen? So the answer to this one is well behaved. It's the only one where you can really justify the two words needing it that, that are truly becoming one singular meaning. Class and teacher aren't, they're still separate. We've got the classroom and we've got the teacher, the teacher of the class. They're just two separate things. Um, I've got a helpful group. It's just an adjective describing a noun. That, that's fine. doesn't need to be compounded. And then we've got the year six children. Once again, the children are their own separate thing. And the, and the words before it are just adjectives. They're just describing what, you know, the, more about the children. However, well behaved is being combined to make one single compound adjective. We're just trying, we're not trying to describe them as well, as in like <laughs> they're, they're not ill. And we're not trying to describe them as just behaved. We're actually trying to make it more, put more emphasis on the, the idea they're behaved by saying they're well behaved. Like that's great. So we put a hyphen in between these. Now it says tick the box. Don't put the hyphen in it. Like don't be a donut like me. Tick the box because the hyphen would go there. Okay. And that's how you use hyphens to, um, to, to compound adjectives uh, or meanings together into one meaning. Okay, guys, it's your turn. We've got to the end of this video. Thank you for sticking around. Even if you've just looked at some of the chapters and um, skipped through this video, then I do appreciate you watching. Um, and we're, obviously, we've got lots of other SATS videos on the way and already released, so do go and check them out. But I will leave you with this, and you can put your answers in the comments. I've just made up one random uh, punctuation question for you to use today, for, for you to solve. And it says this, write one word using an apostrophe to show that the fluffy hat belongs to Dylan. You've got to write one word in here with an apostrophe to show that that is true. I'll leave you with that. Pop your answer down in the comment section and I'll give you a like. I'll give you a thumbs up or even maybe one of the, the little heart symbols that you can put in comments these days on your comment if you got it right. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure doing this video for you. It was a really long one, um, but we'll be back for plenty more. We've got reading content coming up in the future. We've got loads more maths and we've got some other GPS stuff as well, like grammar and word classes. I know Dylan's working on that video right now. So see you soon, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, like and subscribe. Bye.